Morning, everybody. Okay. So let's start with a few minutes spending time uh, with the Merrifield and taking refuge in them and spending time at, uh, with all the sentient beings, leading them in taking refuge and generating a bodhicitta meditation for uh, motivation for them. So uh, these are, are, you know, two of the important fields of merit uh, that we have that Shantideva really emphasized in this last chapter, how they're um, both similar in uh, being fields with which we can create a tremendous amount of merit, uh, but how they're different in terms of their qualities, such as wisdom and compassion and so on. Okay, But we need both in order to become Buddhas. And as, uh, uh, you know, Rinpoche keeps reminding me, we especially need the people who bug us and annoy us and threaten us and disturb our peace and calm and aggravate us and irritate us and make us crazy. Yeah, those are the ones that we need the most because we can't develop fortitude without them. And we can't develop fortitude with the Buddhas because the Buddhas don't have that effect on us. Okay? So, think of all the Sams in the world. Yeah, and an interesting thing is to ask if we are somebody else's Sams. Who, me? No. I wouldn't be like that towards somebody else. Never. Yeah. So then, from that viewpoint, there's a whole world of infinite, innocent people and no Sams in the world, except for the ones I know. Yeah. But we're not anybody else's Sam, are we? We're nice, cooperative, easy to get along with people. Yeah. I had a friend who, uh, uh, he worked on in mediation. He was a mediator. And um, I, you know, went to some of his, uh, you know, his classes sometimes and our seminars. And I remember one of them when he... Uh, you know, ask the people there, you know, how many of you are here because of other people who disturb you? Everybody raises their hand and he says, and how many of you are here because you disturb other people? Nobody is. <laughs> and he said, it's so interesting. Whenever I hold seminars, I always get the agreeable, cooperative people who come to the seminars, but not the ones that, you know, really irritate and aggravate everybody else. How interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, the visualization of the merit field in front of us us surrounded by sentient beings and all those Sams sitting right in front of us, between us and the Buddha. So to see the Buddha, we have to see Sam. There's no way to avoid it.
Let's generate a motivation. And recall that all the misery in the world, the three kinds of dukkha, all of them come back to afflictions and karma and the ignorance in which they are rooted. So we have to be completely clear in our mind. Yeah, ignorance, afflictions, karma are the source of our misery and our confusion and our wandering in cyclic existence. And those all reside in our own mind, in our own mind, not outside. And so if we want happiness, the solution is to change our own mind. It's not to try and make other people do or not do what we want or don't want them to do. And this is the situation for each and every sentient being. So rather than compete and quarrel with other sentient beings, it makes more sense to cooperate so that we could all arrive at the other shore of nirvana. And so with that, generate the bodhicitta as our heartfelt motivation to learn the teachings so that we will know how to put them into practice properly. So at the end of last session, we were uh, 
there's a suggestion to go over chapter six again, or to go back to chapter two, or make a, maybe go on to chapter 20, <laughs> even though Shantideva hasn't gotten that far yet. Um, okay, what I decided in the inter- interim is to keep going, you know, and do a joyous effort. Um, some of the verses at the beginning of chapter seven are talking about death and using uh, death as a motivator to us to practice. And I was thinking that after the, you know, studying about fortitude and really watching how our anger operates, uh, I don't know about you, but many of us may have regrets for how we have treated other sentient beings in the past by being angry, angry and belligerent and so on. And uh, so I thought that, that uh, the verses at the beginning of chapter 7 would have the, the same effect as going back to chapter 2 to invigorate us to uh, think back at the times we've gotten upset or angry or intolerant of others um, and do some purification about that. Okay. So, you know, we may think that, okay, we yeah, we did the, the chapter on fortitude and I have a much better... Uh, understanding now of the disadvantages of anger and I'm really working on myself and you know because I I can see in the past that I blew it and I have regret for that yeah and you know it it yeah great great I mean that's what Shanti Deva is wants us to have what I've discovered is that I can feel that very much in my heart, the re, you know, the regret, yeah, uh, for how I've acted. And then in the next moment, turn around and say, but how else was I supposed to respond when somebody did that? Okay. And so from one moment to the next, I go from, okay, yes, getting angry, you know, it's a defilement, there's all these disadvantages, to right back to the usual samsaric way of thinking of, but I had no choice. Any sane, sentient being would get angry at this. And if you don't get angry, you're going to get walked all over. So how else am I supposed to act when this idiot does this? Okay. Uh, Do you have that go on in your mind? Yeah. A couple of you look so innocent and sweet. How nice. Yeah. But if we look, you know, we could go from one moment to the next to, but there's no other way to respond when somebody harms me. Yeah? There's no other alternative. Yeah? There is only a one-way street when somebody harms me. There's only one way to go, and that is getting angry. Yeah? and putting them in their place or getting out of there as fast as I can. Yeah. There's no other choice. And that is very deeply rooted inside of us. Yeah. So we go through all the arguments and we make some progress with the arguments. But when push comes to shove, yeah, when they push us, we shove back, (laughs) okay, Out out of the force of familiarity. And 
and we have our reason. You know, it's not just familiarity. We can't just say, oh, I do that and it's a habit. We can't just assign all of our negative actions to, well, it's just a habit, so I have to break a habit. No, because there is a reason in our mind why we think that behavior is good. Yeah, it's not just habit. There's some reason going on. Okay. Yeah, you think we're stupid? We're not stupid. We have reasons for everything we do. It's just our reasons are stupid. (laughs) Okay, but we have those reasons. And we have to ferret out those reasons and really look at them and see how stupid they are and how counterproductive they are. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the reasons is, well, how else am I supposed to act? There's only one choice. Yeah. And that sounds like a very good reason, because most people, i.e. our friends, would agree with that reason. People who aren't our friends would not agree with that reason, but that's why they're not our friends. Okay, but our friends would agree, yeah, there's only one way to act in that situation. And this is what you got to do. Yeah? And we are so much influenced by what other people think about us. It's just amazing. Yeah? I, I was reading something. I can't remember what it was. But somebody was saying that more than ideology influencing us, it's what our friends and what other people in general think that influences us. Okay, so we're not always influenced so much by the ideology, but by, well, everybody else believes that. Everybody else is doing that. Yeah. Everybody else thinks that. So if everybody else thinks that, then I don't need to use any analysis. I don't need to use my wisdom. Everybody thinks like that. Everybody does that. It must be right. Yeah? Okay. So we never really ask ourselves, Why am, you know, what's the real reason for doing this? And so, well, everybody says you do things this way. Yeah. And so much of our life is pre programmed, isn't it? Yeah. You get born. Yeah. And you play. And then you go to kindergarten. Maybe you go to preschool first. Then you go to kindergarten. Then, you know, you finish high school. Then, of course, in some families, you know, your life is already pre-planned. You go to college. There's no choice about that. And some, then you also go to graduate school. And you, whatever it is, you graduate on Friday. You start work on Monday. And you work for the next, what is it, 50 years? Something like that. And uh, then you... Uh, retire uh, with dreams of going to live by a golf course, but you're too old and, you know, sick to actually do that, and and then you die. And that's what everybody does, so you don't need to think about doing it. Yeah? I mean, what do you, there's, they, they say that there's certain stages of development that we go through, you know, ways, certain stages of emotional maturity. Well, yeah, there's, you know, progressions of stages of emotional maturity. But a lot of the way that they get acted out is because that's what everybody does. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the same with our anger. Everybody thinks like that. Everybody acts that way. So, yeah. 
I don't need to think about why I do, because everybody else does. Okay? So that is, that is a tricky point for us. Yeah? Because to really resolve these things that we drag along with us our entire life, issues of resentment, you know, from whatever happened in the past, we drag those things along our whole life. We never become peaceful and accepting with those things. Yeah. And why? Because we haven't really gotten to the bottom of it, of it so that we could just accept that that's what happened. That's all. Yeah, that's what happened. Because we go, that's what happened. Therefore, I need to respond with anger, belligerence, stubbornness, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And to just get to the point of that's what, ha- that's what happened. And it involves these sentient beings who are just like me with minds overwhelmed by ignorance and afflictions. Yeah. So what's the purpose of blaming people? Yeah. Who am I trying to impress when I blame somebody else instead of being accountable myself for what I did? Yeah. And it, it's so, it's, so we really have to go into these things, you know, to resolve them and make peace with them and be able to put them down. Otherwise, you know, they are like leeches and we carry them around everywhere we go and act with this habitual behavior and create an identity about it. I have this problem because... This, 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 this. Okay? So, some people may say, wait, 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 wait. You know, if you go to therapy, you, you see that there are external circumstances that happen that condition people. You know? And those external circumstances are created by other people. And... You know, this is the way human beings react. Well, yes, that's true as a worldly way of seeing it. Okay. As a Dharma way of seeing it, we have to go deeper. Okay. Yeah. Therapy is extremely helpful for some people. But you're not going to get enlightened by going to a therapist. Yeah? So, this kind of really digging in there and like, what is going on in my mind? Yeah? Okay. And then owning it and then so often just being able to sit there and go, that's a really strange stupid thing to hang on to, (laughs) you know, or that's a ridiculous way to think. And not, and saying that to ourselves in that tone of voice, not, that's such a stupid way to think, that's so ridiculous to think like that, with the undercover message of you're so stupid, you know, what kind of Dharma practitioner is you? You can't get out of anything, blah, 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 and turn it into another self-put-down that's all about me. Okay? So it's to acknowledge, you know, the stupidagios. That's an Italian word, which I love. It makes so much It's a great word, isn't it? Stupidagio. Yeah. To acknowledge our stupidagios. And then put them down. Yeah. 
because this whole thing of, you know, oh, I'm so guilty. Look what I've done. This is terrible. How am I ever going to get over this? Oh, I can never purify enough. Nobody else has ever, you know, done something like this. <sighs> yeah. Another way to to exaggerate our own importance. Yeah. Really. It's such a narrow way of thinking, isn't it? It's like this. You know, the the way of thinking, well, I've got to be like this because everybody else thinks this way, is extremely narrow. You don't give yourself any options. And the way of, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, there's, there's... I'm irredeemable. That's equally as narrow. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, there's this whole wide world and many ways to look at a situation. And and we choose really stupid ones. (laughs) Yeah. And everybody else does too. So how can we be mad at all these people? Yeah. If they were Buddhas who were acting like worldly sentient beings, it would be one thing. Like, hey, you're a Buddha. You're supposed to act better than that. Okay. Then you, then you could blame the Buddha. Okay. Like, <laughs> hey, Ma Kala. You know, all this wrathful stuff. You're just angry, trampling on everybody, you know, who impinges on the Dharma all the time. Cut it out. You know, you should be more like Chen Rezi. You know, I like, are we going to, you know, actually, uh, we don't, there's nothing to blame for a Buddha, okay? Yeah, there's, we can't blame the Buddhas for anything. But, what, you know, we we want to blame Buddhas for, for being sentient beings and uh, worldly sentient beings, yeah. But when worldly sentient beings act like worldly sentient beings, why do we say you guys should act like Buddhas? Yeah, I mean, expecting them to act like Buddhas is really a bit too much. Yeah. So when other sentient beings do what they do. Yeah. That's just sent- sentient beings do what sentient beings do. And our choice is whether we're going to get annoyed, irritated, enraged, you know, stubborn, revengeful about what they did. But what they did is just what sentient beings do. And we may say, but it's so terrible. It's so dishonest. There's the ten non-virtues, and they're breaking all those non-virtues. I mean, keeping all those non-virtues, and it's affecting me, and they should stop doing that. Yeah, says the pot to the kettle. (laughs) <laughs> yeah says the guy with a glass house to the ones who, st- who throw stones you know so it's very interesting to try and catch ourselves yeah when we're we're just doing a repeat that doesn't get us anywhere. And then we go, but if I accept it, that means it's okay. Yeah. If I accept the horrible things people do to other people, you know, then it's okay that they do that. Okay. Now, now look, at, look at that argument. What's the reasoning behind it? Yeah. If I say it's okay, then it 
you know, if I accept it, it must be okay to do it. Yeah? If I accept that this is the way sentient beings act, that they lie and steal and these things, yeah? If I accept that, then I'm saying it's okay for anybody in the world to act like that. Is that reasonable? If I, if I say somebody's misdeed is okay, if I just accept that that happened, that then it means I'm giving permission to everybody to do it. Yeah? Is that true? Yeah? It, sometimes we get caught in that trap, too. If I accept it, it means it's okay for everybody to do. Yeah? This bee stung me. If I accept that the bee stung me, you know, and just have compassion for some sentient being who's born in a bee's body, Versus turning around and smashing that bee. If I just accepted, yeah, I got a bee stung me. Then it's okay for every bee to sting me. And it's also okay for people to bite me and for everything else. No, we're not saying that. Yeah, when we accept something, we're accepting what is in this very moment. We're not accepting that th- that it's fine to keep going on in that direction for anybody, including myself. You know, in, in the same way, if you know, if I accept my bad behavior, then, you know, and don't beat myself to death, then I'm I'm going to do it again. And I'm saying to myself, it's okay if I do it again. Yeah. So you see, there's some reason in there. But it's a very faulty reason. Why does accepting what exists now mean that you don't have to be try and do things better in the future? Yeah. Why is accepting that a situation happened now? Why do we think that that means it's okay for everybody else to do it in the future? They're two different things. Yeah. Accepting what has happened. You know, why do you accept what has happened? Because it has happened, and there's nothing you can do about it once it happened. Okay, you cannot undo it. Okay, so if you accept it, then there's a chance not to get stuck in all the emotions about how it shouldn't have been that way. But just saying that happened, I accepted that happened, does not mean you're giving yourself or anybody else the okay to do it in the future. Yeah? We still try and do things better in the future. Is this making some sense? Yeah? So to catch ourselves, because, you know, self-centered mind is extremely shrewd. Yeah? It's very shrewd, and it will come up with all sorts of ways. Yeah. To kind of, yeah, keep us bound. So we got to learn to catch it. So I think we had, what, two four verses more in this chapter, <laughs> and then we'll go on. Okay. But 131 and 132 are very much emphasizing that a king, a powerful person, yeah, who usually, you know, 
we're like, we have all sorts of reactions to somebody who who's in power. Um, many of them deluded reactions. Uh, but a king can not harm us the way the guardians of hell harm us as a result of our negative actions. And a king cannot grant us Buddhahood like our own virtuous actions can bring us to full awakening. So what it's getting at is worldly power is not so powerful. (laughs) Yeah, it might be powerful in this world, but it doesn't last forever, and it's extremely limited, and it is no match for karma. Yeah? So you can... uh, avoid getting indicted. You can avoid all these kinds of things, but there's no way to avoid uh, experiencing the results of our own actions. Okay. Then 133. Yeah, so this is this whole previous section is all about how we should value sentient beings because they're so necessary for our own enlightenment. Yeah. And and I really, you know, when you have nothing to do, yeah, because you often, yeah, when even when you have something to do, yeah, look at all the people around you who you're doing that something with and think, my enlightenment depends on them. Okay. Yeah, so you're setting up for something. You're taking down something. I am very impressed with the people who set up and take down things in this room and how quickly you do it. Yay! <laughs> yeah. So, but, yeah, when you're doing that, I said, oh, God, i got to do it. Why are all these other people leaving? It's me. You know, it's like my enlightenment depends on all these people. And I have the opportunity to serve the Sangha. The Sangha is a merit field. So why should I waste my opportunity to create merit by being annoyed and complaining? Well, I can think of many reasons why I, you know. <laughs> yeah, because what do I usually do? I complain. Yeah. But when you really sit and ask yourself that, you know, what good reasons do I have for complaining? You know, I have the opportunity to serve the Sangha and I'm complaining. Like she said the other day, I'm, um, you know, I, I, I have, th- I'm I'm taking in all the food that people are offering to us that I'm going to eat, and I'm complaining about having to do that. You know? It's like, stupid. But this is the way we think. So catching ourselves in all of that kind of stuff. Okay? And so that's when you have something to do. When you don't have anything to do, especially in the summer where there's tons of bugs. You know, and the winter there's actually a lot of bugs too. You know, I thought they would all go away in the winter. Yeah, no, they they are some of them are quite active. So um you know, you look at the bugs and each bug, you know, each bug, each spider that's crawling on your walls that you're afraid is going to crawl into bed with you that night. See, have you ever gotten bitten by a spider? Oh, it itches. Yeah. So there's a spider on that wall over there, but he may get over here by tonight. You know, and I'm sure he'll crawl under the covers because I've caught spiders under the covers before. So I've got to get that spider out of here. Also, because he may have his whole family. Yeah. If I don't do that, he's going to reproduce. 
and spiders reproduce like rabbits. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want all these spiders. And then you stop and you say, my awakening depends on that spider. If I don't have compassion for that spider, I am putting a formidable roadblock in my own spiritual practice. And why shouldn't I have compassion for a spider? Because who wants to be born as a spider? Yeah, I don't hear all sorts of people going, I want to be reborn as a spider. They may say, I want to study spiders, but they don't say, I want to be reborn as one. And that spider was also my kind mother in a previous life. So one of my friends told me a story. He was quite close to his nephew. My friend lived in India. It's the same one who slipped on the fruit going down the street. And uh, he was very close to his nephew. And I don't know what happened with his nephew, but his nephew died. I think it was his nephew, unless it was his uncle. Anyway, it was one relative that he was very close to. Yeah, had died. And so, he, you know, he's living in India, in Dharamsala. And in Dharamsala, yeah, they have really big spiders. I mean, you know, really big spiders, like this big spiders. Okay, I'm not joking. Yeah, I mean, they have a small thing, but they're these, and I tend to, I want to say tentacles, but they're not tentacles, they're arms and legs. Okay, huge. And they can contort themselves to f- go around anything. There was one who kept coming in our room through, we were fortunate to have, they put a washing machine in our room or a dryer or something, but the spiders, would come in, these enormous spiders would come in through the exhaust pipe for from the dryer. Yeah. And you don't want to meet when you're going to the bathroom in the middle of the night or even in the daytime. You don't want to bump into one of these guys in the bathroom, you know, which is how they entered. And uh, they really liked the bathroom. They would come out into our room when they got bored with the bathroom, but (laughs) they liked the bathroom, you know? And you're not sure where they're going to be hiding when you go in. And uh, so, okay, so my friend was in his room after his relative died, and uh, one of those spiders showed up in his room, and his instant reaction was, you know, it's a combination of fear and I can't stand it, get it out of here. Yeah, so fear and repulsion and anger, you know, I got to get it out of here. And then he told me, he thought, what if that spider was the next life of my close relative who had just died? What if my uncle had been was had been born as that spider? And he said when he had that thought, his whole feeling about the spider changed. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. As soon as that, that thought came of this was somebody who I was close to in the past. then he couldn't hate the spider. So, you know, when, because, you know, after we we love that it's getting a little bit warmer now, okay? But for those of you who haven't been here in the springtime, guess who comes in the spring? It's not Santa Claus. (laughs) It's ticks, okay? Big ticks. We don't have the little microscopic ones. We just have the big ones, you know. And they bite you. 
and it itches for like a whole week or something. It's really, it's like, when is tick season going to be over? Never, <laughs> you know. But to think, every time you find a, a chick, a chick, a tick, you know, crawling on you, you know, this was my kind relative. This was my best friend. You know, what a pity that they were born as a tick. Yeah. And may I never create the karma that would make me get born like that. Okay? So you really use, you know, every opportunity, every sentient being you come in contact with. Yeah. When you watch the news, you know, which is, it's not the news, it's a comedy show, <laughs> you know, or it's, it's a, what is it, tragic comedy, a, 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 a funny tragedy, I don't know, but it is weird, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going on, and to think they have all been very kind to me and very loving to me in the past. And look, they were born in these roles, especially where they have a lot of power (laughs) and so little wisdom and so little ethical conduct. And what a tragedy that is, you know? Because we, if we look around, the people we're close to in this life, we wouldn't want them to be born like that. Well, here's somebody we were close to in a previous life that was. Yeah. So, again, instead of hating them, we can have compassion. And then, yeah, our logic steps in and says, if I'm compassionate for that idiot who's destroying the country, then I'm, uh, what's the, the word? Um, yeah, starts with, yeah, uh, no, it's another word that starts with C. Anyway, yeah, I'm aiding and abetting. What? I'm com- complicit. Complicit. I'm complicit. Okay, so I can't have compassion for them because if I have compassion then I'm complicit in what they're doing. Okay, is that true? That if you have compassion for somebody, you are complicit in what they're doing and you approve of what they do. Do you have to approve of what somebody's doing to have compassion for them? Yeah. Does having compassion for somebody mean that it's okay that they keep doing what they're doing? even though what they're doing is harming themselves and others? No, none of those things. Go back to our debating text, you know, when we're checking pervasions. And ask yourself, you know, does this statement, you know, mean that one? And no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, having compassion does not mean what the other person's doing is okay. It also does not mean that you're complicit in what they're doing. You can call out what they're doing, but without being angry. Yeah. And then we circle back to, but anger is the only possible way to deal with this situation. Okay, so you see, we're caught in a net of all these ridiculous um, things that seem logical but are actually quite unreasonable. And, uh, and to really think about those you know, and, and take them apart and see how false they are. Okay, so verse 133. Why do I not see that my future attainment of Buddhahood as well as glory, renown, and happiness in this very life, all come from pleasing sentient beings. Yeah. So my future attainment of Buddhahood, yes, it definitely comes from pleasing sentient beings. Sentient beings have been kind to me. When I do things that benefit them, I please them. But then 
something says, well, actually, I do things to benefit them, and then they get mad at me. So what are you saying? It comes from pleasing sentient beings. If I have to please them, then I should get an alcohol, and give an alcoholic more, more booze. Yeah, that's what pleases them. Yeah. And if somebody's corrupt, then to please them, I should join in their corruption. That makes them happy. So again, false logic. Yeah, making somebody happy, pleasing somebody, does not mean that they like you at that very moment. Or even that they ever like you. Okay, pleasing somebody means you do what is beneficial for that person in the long run. run. Okay, but lots of times, pleasing them is just being a nice person right here and now. Yeah, and creating harmony uh, in a situation. Because we all live amidst other sentient beings. You know, I don't care you want to go to a, 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 sna- a, a cave way up in the Himalayas. You're still surrounded by sentient beings there. Yeah. Did you know that there's spiders that live in snow? Yeah, that spiders exude some things like antifreeze, you know, that keeps them from freezing in the snow. So I don't care wherever you go. Yeah, you're still surrounded by sentient beings, you know, even if you're up in the cave. I mean, because how are you going to get your food? Yeah. Well, I'll pick the nettles. Well, you don't have Venerable Pende around to do it for you. <laughs> She's the expert nettle picker, you know. <laughs> so, you know, to, to really, really look, you know, no matter where we live, we exist in relationship to other sentient beings. And especially, you know, most of us live very close to other sentient beings. So pleasing sentient beings can be as small as, you know, passing the ketchup or, you know, some vacuuming the floor for somebody. Oh my God, did I say that? They'll think I'm asking too much. Yeah, suggesting that you vacuum the floor when it's, when it's not your turn on the road. How dare I even suggest that? But think about it, you know, just learning how to create harmony in a community where we live. Yeah, that's pleasing sentient beings because we'd all rather live in a place that's harmonious. And I've lived in plenty of unharmonious dharma centers. Yeah. And this is not only not a Dharma center, but it is not going to be disharmonious. <laughs> because if it is, all of us are going to go away. And then the spiders will have it. And the ticks, yeah, they'll be dancing here. Yeah. Okay. So future attainment of Buddhahood comes from pleasing sentient beings. And glory, renown, and happiness in this life all comes from pleasing sentient beings. Okay, happiness in this life, yeah. But do you want do you want glory and renown? You know, I think you have to really be a bodhisattva to really want glory and renown. Yeah. Why? Because you have so much pressure on you from being famous. Yeah. So many people have their ideas of who you are and what you should be and how you should act and what you should attain. And that you have... You're, you're like this with everybody's peer pressure. Yeah. Now, you might think, but being a Rinpoche, you know, 
okay, yeah, it might be nice to be a Rinpoche. Then I get to sit up front and I'm near all the other Rinpoches and people give me tangerines and pears and they all go like this when they're near me and bend over. And, you know, yeah, being, being a Rinpoche, then I'm kind of the boss. Yeah, I can tell people what to do and they'll do it and they'll really respect me. You, if you think like that, you've never been a Rinpoche. <laughs> you've never even been in a leadership position. First of all, the first job point in the job description of a, of a leader is you are the person who everybody blames when they don't like something. Okay, so you've got to get used to that. Then, second of all, being a Rinpoche. Okay. Now, I, I've, I've stayed with the incarnation of one of my root teachers. And I watch what, what goes on. And, you know, you have, you're a kid and you can't just be a kid. Yeah. Everybody has so many expectations. It's like all their namtok. Remember namtok? It's spilled on top of this poor child. And they all want, you know, whoever you were close to in your previous life, you're supposed to be friends with that person this lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> and people who you weren't so close to in your previous life, you know, whose views you didn't agree with, then again, this lifetime, you're, you're not close to them. And there's a rank among Rinpoches. Yeah, there's a definite rank. And so dependent on your place in the rank, you can, you can go, you must go to visit the Rinpoches that are higher than you. But you cannot go to visit the Rinpoches who are lower than you. Yeah. So if you're friends with a Rinpoche who's lower than you, you can't just go over to their house and no, no, they have to come to you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I won't go into all of it, but, but renown and glory can be very confining. Yeah. You don't have personal freedom. Just to, you know, can you imagine? I, I mean, I could tell you, you know, when, when Sarkham Rinpoche walked down the street, what happened? But, I mean, you know, all these people come, and it's like he's just trying to walk down the street. And these people are like, you know, they want hand blessings, you know, where they touch. Yeah. And they're doing it out of faith. It's really sweet. I mean, the faith and devotion of the Tibetans is just remarkable. Yeah. But he can't even walk down the street and look at things and just, you know, be casual. He always has to be on. And His Holiness Dalai Lama, forget it. He cannot walk down the street. There's no way. Yeah. First of all, there has to be the Indian guards, okay? You have to have a security detail. And, I mean, everybody, they, they would just, he couldn't move. Everybody would just swarm around him. He couldn't even take two steps down the street. Yeah. So his the palace area where he is, you know, he, he can't just say, oh, I feel like taking a walk. You know, see what people are doing in McLeod today. You know, he's stuck there. And to me, when I look at that, what an incredible sacrifice to you sacrifice your personal freedom to be an important person. Yeah. Now, he has the compassion that is willing to sacrifice like that for the benefit of sentient beings. I don't, <laughs> you know. 
So for me to, to think about, you know, glory, because glory and renown, it sounds good, you know. And I remember, oh, when I was little, I wanted to be famous, you know. It's like I wanted to sing and dance, and you know, because fame was good. Fame means that a lot of people liked you, and of course I wanted people to like me. So that means, you know, I better be famous, and I wanted to be famous. And, you know, I'm so glad I grew out of that, you know. It's really... It's, I don't think it's worth it. Okay. So you see, yeah, so there, in, in terms of the Dharma, there's some very, very famous teachers. I mean, like His Holiness or, you know, whatever. Very famous teachers. And they teach a huge number of disciples. But it's very difficult to have personal uh, a personal relationship with them, especially to have uh, practice instructions, personal practice instructions. I have two friends who have that kind of relationship with His Holiness, but it's extremely rare, you know, and they are not at all, they don't, they, other people don't know about it, except, the, you know. So then you have other teachers you know, and I have other teachers, you know, I mean, some of my teachers are very famous, and some of my teachers you would never notice in a crowd, yeah? And they they go to, you know, to the bazaar, and they'll buy vegetables when they need to, and they'll do the korwa around, you know, the hill, and nobody notices them, and they are incredible practitioners. And what's really nice is you can go and visit them in their room and ask a lot of Dharma questions. And they have the time to sit there and answer your questions. Yeah. The very important teachers, they don't have the time to do that. Yeah. Because, you know, every Losang, Dechen, and, and Tashi wants to come see them. But the teachers that are not so well known, you know, they, what you see is that everybody has their own way of benefiting sentient beings. And it's not imperative to have glory and fame to benefit sentient beings. Okay. When they talk about different, there's seven special conditions of, uh, of not just a precious human life, but a super precious human life. And one of them is, you know, being born in a renowned family or being wealthy and so on. And the idea is, if you're wealthy, you can do a lot of good works for other sentient beings. And if you're from a very famous family or in India, a high caste, then people will respect you and that gives you the opportunity to benefit them because you're respected. So yes, having wealth having, you know, being of high social class, you can use that to benefit others. Yeah. So that's one reason for having them. But just to say, as well as glory, renown, and happiness of this life, and then you sit and visualize yourself as having <laughs> glory, renown, and happiness, you know, like that, and your mind's very worldly, that kind of glory and renown is, you know, besides being a big trap for Dharma practice, um, you really have very little space in your life. And, and if you really want to benefit sentient beings, you look, I mean, every teacher has their own style and they all are able to benefit because sentient beings have such a variety of karma. They all benefit different sentient beings. And even to one sentient being, they benefit that person in different ways. Yeah. So it uh yeah, don't don't get hung up in the glory and renown business. Yeah. Because um yeah, I mean if you think about it, even right now here in this life, if your friend has a problem, yeah. Is His Holiness going to be able to come and help your friend with their problem? No, 
Are you going to be able to help your friend? Yes. Okay. So right here and now, you know, we don't have to be famous. We don't have to already be Buddhas to be a benefit. We have to uh, benefit what's right in front of our nose at that particular moment. Okay. Instead of, you know, oh, this would make a great skit, you know, Superman Bodhisattva flying in. Oh, you have a problem. You know, what is it? It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. And then you fly in and everybody faints because Superman, Super Bodhisattva is here. Okay. <laughs> Super Sattva. Yeah. <laughs> Super Sattva has arrived. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, we don't have to be super sattva. You can be very, uh, very discreet. Yeah, very low key. And, and, uh, yeah, I don't know about other people, but for me, the people that uh, seem to be a little bit full of themselves, I say seem to be because I don't know if they are or not. It's my projection. But that kind of thing doesn't impress, it impresses me the wrong way. Put it that way. Okay. Then we'll do our second verse for the day. (laughs) Okay, 134. While in cyclic existence, fortitude causes beauty, health, and renown. Because of these, I shall live for a very long time and win the extensive pleasure of the universal Chakravarta kings. So I think verses like this where they talk about the benefits in this life, we also have a couple of verses in the Pratimoksha that talk about the benefits of keeping precepts in terms of of what you get this life. And I think those verses are designed for two kinds of people. One is the person who... uh, who wants that kind of stuff. And so by their knowing that they can get that in this life, it inspires them to practice. So that's good. You know, it's, it inspires somebody to pe- keep better ethical discipline or to practice better. Yeah. Um, or two, it, uh, it gets us really thinking about, okay, if you have those kind of worldly qualities, how would you use them to benefit sentient beings? Now, what would you do? Okay, so, and then they talk about the universal Chakravarta kings. So those are the the kings of the whole universe. Yeah, the Chakravarta kings. Yeah, when we do, when we're doing the mandala offering, and we have, you know, the, the, um, all the precious things. Those are all the possessions of the Chakravarta kings. So that's much bigger than being president of the United States. You know, it's like you're president of the universe and, uh, you know, and you, nobody's going to run against you. Um, okay. But that, if you think about it, yeah, in a Dharma way, well, yes, it's a nice, good rebirth. Yeah, If you are a bodhisattva, taking rebirth like that gives you an opportunity for to benefit many sentient beings, so that's very good. But if you're not a bodhisattva, is it good to crave that kind of rebirth for your own worldly pleasure? Well, for me, it doesn't look like worldly pleasure. Okay. But for some people, maybe it does. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine being the Chakravarta king? Everybody, one person after another comes in. You know, I'm, I came all the way here from planet Earth. Why can't I see the king? You're keeping me waiting. I'm from planet Earth. We're very important. We're the biggest speck among all the tiny specks. <laughs> And I want to report, planet Earth is in a mess. So 
Chakravarta king, you got to come and do something about it. It's in your, in your realm. It's in your, your, you know, it's part of your kingdom. So please come to planet Earth and do something. Yeah. And, and the Chakravarta king says, okay, yeah, what do you want me to do? Yeah. What do you want Chakravarta king to do? How's he going to fix everything on planet Earth? Yeah. Well, we're going to have one mass Dharma teaching. <laughs> we're going to build a big platform in the middle of the Pacific Ocean so everybody can sit on one platform and nobody can leave the teaching. <laughs> Yeah, and then we're going to teach them all the Dharma. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So maybe for auspiciousness, we should go on to the first verse in the next <laughs> chapter. <laughs> Although maybe do you have questions so far or comments? Um, someone online is asking, um, if, I'm a, if I'm unsuccessful in persuading someone to think with reason, is that a failure in my attempt to be pleasing or beneficial to them? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because what are you going to do? I, what, what's the alternative? You've tried to help this person and get them to think in a reasonable way. And, you know, they're locked into their own, their own way of thinking. Does that mean you're a failure? No. You did what you could, and, you know, you can't do what you can't do. What is it? You can't uh, get oil from sand. So you're not a failure. It's this is one of the situations that you have to accept, you know. And the thing is, keep the door open so that later, if that person starts to think in a different way, that they feel they can come back to you and ask for help. Okay. Yeah. Who said you had to be successful? in all your endeavors to benefit sentient beings. Yeah. The Buddha, all the Buddhas, infinite, countless Buddhas, have been trying to lead us to awakening since beginning this time. Have they been successful? Are they failures because they haven't done that? Yeah. Any other... Questions, comments? Anything? Okay. So, chapter seven. Yeah. So, there's various translations. One uh, is enthusiasm, which is what the translator here used. Another, we use joyous effort. Yeah. Some people just say effort, but it, it's more than just effort because... Uh, we our connotation of effort can sometimes mean drudge drudgery okay but this is not drudgery it's like you're happy to do it okay so what it's getting at is when we practice the dharma we should be happy to practice the dharma yeah instead of oh god <laughs> Is the alarm going off already? I have to go to morning meditation. I'm so exhausted. And then I'm on breakfast duty. <gasps> this is too much. Okay. <laughs> I'll drag myself out of bed because I have the opportunity to serve the sangha. <laughs> Oh, 
Yeah. And I really want to create that merit. Okay. Okay, body, move. Get out of this bed. Uh, 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 okay, a lot of bed. Oh, now I got to prostrate to the Buddha. Oh, but I'm so exhausted. I want to crawl back in bed. But I'll create merit if I prostrate to the Buddha. <laughs> So you do that, and you get down. <laughs> and this is a long prostration <laughs> because you don't get up for another half an hour. When I lived in, when I lived in Copan, there was um, there was one monk, and uh, and you know we had morning meditation. We all had to go to and. Uh, he was late one morning. <laughs> Why are you late? And, uh, well, I prostrated to the Buddha, and I got down, and then I fell asleep. <laughs> so, yeah, and I didn't wake up until medita- morning meditation had already started. Uh, that was a good one, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... It's it's not that kind of effort. It's like a happy mind of really valuing our life. Yeah, really valuing our life and of valuing the opportunities we have. And this comes from making that radical shift to having a Buddhist worldview. Because as long as we hang up Hang on to the world, the worldly worldview. Then so many things are just miserable. When we, our mind, the more it really becomes familiar and really believes in the Buddhist worldview, then the happier we become to do these things because we're happy to create merit. We want to become a Buddha to benefit sentient beings. Okay, so that's why it's got to be joyous and enthusiastic and not drudgery. So having fortitude, I should develop joyous effort. For awakening will dwell only in those who exert themselves. Just as there is no movement without wind, so merit does not occur without joyous effort. Okay. So, yeah, awakening dwells only in those who exert themselves. Yeah. So it's it's not like, oh, okay, I'm a Buddhist now. I've done enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I used to be a whatever, you know, and now I'm a Buddhist. That's good enough. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's good enough depending upon what you want to get out of your life. Yeah. But if you want to be awakened, then, uh, you know, you have to have this joy in your practice. Okay. And so there's no movement without wind. Yeah. So this is good to think whenever we encounter windy days. Yeah. Instead of how many trees are going to fall over that we have to saw <laughs> <laughs> how many paths are blocked that we're going to have to <laughs> free, you know, because of the wind. Instead of thinking that, think, you know, no move, just as no movement occurs without wind. Yeah, so merit does not occur without joyous effort. You know? And so then, oh, look at the opportunity I have. You know, and look at all these sentient beings around me that, I get to practice with, and that are objects of me benefiting. Okay. Oh, so another very important thing about uh, pleasing sentient beings is pleasing sentient beings is very different from being a people pleaser. This has to be extremely clear in the mind. They're two different things. Yeah, pleasing sentient beings, you're doing with a motivation to benefit them. Being a people pleaser, you're doing with a motivation so that people will like you and approve of you. 
and you don't get blamed. Okay? So they're two completely different things. Yeah, don't confuse them. Because many people are people pleasers, but they think they're pleasing sentient beings. And granted, they often do things that are very nice for others. Yeah, so that's nice. But the motivation isn't real clear. Yeah. Or they do things to help others, and they become Mr. or Miss Fix-It. Because helping others means I'm going to have my nose in everybody's business, and I'm going to fix all their problems, and then they're all going to love me for it. Okay. Yeah, we have a few people pleasers here. Yeah, who's a people pleaser? Yeah. Oh, I'm not, (laughs) as you can see. (laughs) Yeah, you want me to please you? No way. (laughs) Okay. But being a people pleaser, I mean, you run all, we had a great skit about being a people pleaser. We should do that one again. Uh, it was great, you know, what, what people pleasers do. And sometimes they can be such a nuisance. Yeah. Because they're, they're tripping all over themselves to please you. And you just want to, you know, do what you're doing. Okay. And then they please you. And then they're, they're waiting for the payback. Yeah. Yeah. And we often have this motivation, you know. Okay, somebody needs that help. I'll help them. Then, when I need a favor, I got them. They'll feel obligated to help me. Or I help them. Then they will praise me up and down and across of how kind I am. You know, helpful I am. Wonderful I am. I wouldn't mind that at all. Yeah. Or they'll praise not just how kind I am, but how wise I am. Because I arrived as super sattva to, <laughs> to fix their problems. I gave them just the perfect advice they needed. And now they're forever grateful to me. You know, you have your big S for (laughs) super sattva. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So they're very, very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yes. Sergeant. Joy. S. S. Effort. <laughs> Actually, I was going to go back to some, another piece. Um, <laughs> is to um, a commitment for myself is to deeply understand what accepting something means. Yeah. You know, I I just it's so important. I just fly right into whatever. Which means, yeah. you know, go ahead. I'm going to sit here and stew or get depressed, and you're going to go do what you want, and I'm just going to hate everything I'm watching. But you know, <laughs> so <laughs> that's not accepted. That's not accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a learning curve for me on that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally transparent. I'm still quite bummed out that we're not going to do a repeat of chapter six, but I will get over it. But maybe. Maybe we can convince you, because it seemed like a fantastic idea a week ago. Yeah, and we can go back and do it. Okay. Later. Okay. (laughs) See, I told you, as soon as you're in the front of the room, somebody's going to complain. No, it was just a a comment. Uh, Well, just, it's so brilliant. I mean, we were more quiet, I think, as a group when it comes to question period in this chapter, because Shanti Deva doesn't give us any room for the yes buts. There's absolutely, he cuts it so fine. Yeah. There's no room. Yeah. 
Yeah, he, he takes the ifs, ands, and buts out of your mouth. <laughs> I, I know here that uh, Shantideva is going through the perfections. I was wondering if you could say anything about the relationship between the mental factor of joyous effort and the perfection of joyous effort. Mm -hmm. Well, you need the mental factor of joyous effort to practice the perfection of joyous effort. Okay. Uh, the perfection of joyous effort is done with a bodhicitta motivation. Okay. The mental factor of joyous effort, you don't, you know, the, bod the perfection is a whole practice. It's your attitude plus what you do. And it's got to be on the basis of, of bodhicitta. Whereas the mental factor of joyous effort is just a mental factor that has, you know, its own particular function. Okay. Yeah, the, there's many terms for, you will see one term used in many ways. Yeah. But it is an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Kind of how do these things relate? Yeah, and when we get into uh, joyous effort, you know, said that uh, discouragement is one of the obstacles to generating joyous effort, and you read that and you go, "But uh, that's how I hold myself accountable. That's how I improve myself. How is that an obstacle?" Yeah. If I'm not self-critical and don't put myself down and beat myself up, then I'm going to be a spoiled brat, and I'm never going to improve. So to have joyous effort, I, I've got to be like that. Somebody once said that to me. I mean, he was in a well, well enough in touch with his own feelings, yeah, or his own thoughts, and he said, you know, if I don't beat myself up, I'm just going to act terribly. It's the thing that keeps me in check and that gets me to improve. And I'm like, you know, that's gonna that's gonna burn you from the inside out. Yeah. Okay.